I love that producer writer relationship and then I write it and I give it to them because it's theirs it's their passion they're the ones who went and found the project in this case this was my first chance to produce what I wrote and that that had a lot of beauty that came with it and to be able to steward something from start to finish was very rewarding. Welcome to Get Seen Unscripted. I'm your host, Jesse Malinowski. We are going to dive into acting insights, meet industry pros, and master the business. Don't forget to subscribe and share. We're keeping you behind the scenes and ahead of the game. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're here. If you're coming back, thank you so much. And if this is your first time watching, big, big welcome to you. I'm so appreciative that you have included our show to be on your journey and to help you in a big way. I'm excited to jump into our awesome guest today. But before I do, I want to read, I'm going to give some YouTube love right now. And the reason I'm going to do that is if you guys haven't checked out our other show, Talent Agent Talk with host talent agent Jason Lockhart. Be sure to do that. And that show is on YouTube. But Roxanne Mim says, I love these podcasts. They're always so informative and entertaining. Thank you for finding a way to give value to the community. And Rob Angelino says, I love your insightful content. I'll keep watching. It's very informative and inspirational for me restarting my career as an older, mature actor. And you know, Rob, I'll say, I absolutely think that it doesn't matter what age you're at. This is, this is what you do. You look on TV. If you see people your age, you can do this thing. So with that, let's jump in with our guest, everyone. I'm very excited to have Cheryl McKay here. She is the creator, writer, showrunner of an upcoming new show, These Stones. What's up, Cheryl? Oh, it's so good to be here, Jesse. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm so excited for you and for your show. And you're going to be on uh, the streaming network Up, mm -hmm. which is more focused on faith and family, correct? Yes. That that, word. It's awesome. called Up Faith and Family. It's their SVOD service. That's awesome. And, and so again, I'm just so excited for you because making a show from start to finish and then getting to this point is no easy feat by any means. Right. <laughs> was there was there ever a was there ever a moment you're like I'm not sure if we're going to get there cuz <laughs> you've been working on this for a while, right? Yes. Well, a lot of it in the beginning happened very quickly. Like once we greenlit what project we wanted to do, I started writing the scripts for it. And five months later, all of them were done. I worked um, collaboratively with the director, Susan Rohr, and we were able to get the funding that next month. And we were in pre-production another month later. I mean, all of that was so fast. Wow. And like, so say I started in January, we were filming by September. And then... We wrapped in October, and then it's been now almost two years since we shot. So the the slower part, of course, is post-production and then selling it and going to conferences and contests and all of that type of thing where you have to go and pound the pavement and show people the show because we wanted to make it independently up front. I feel like that's the thing that so many creatives miss when they want mm -hmm. to create something. You know, they're like, oh, like if you're an mm -hmm. actor, like I I'll be in it. I, I I know I know the actor. I'll be, you know, and and maybe they write the script, and you know, it's that post production and mm -hmm. all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you maybe give someone when it comes to that element to producing a project mm -hmm. from start to finish? Well, it definitely takes a lot of patience, and I think in our case, we shot three and a half hours of content. I thought it, based on page count, it would be two and a half. But when you consider we're posting an extra hour that I didn't realize existed, that was like two movies worth of material. <laughs> wow. You know, and we had a, over 100 special effects in episode one of the six. And so that's partly why it took so long. And we wanted to make sure we did everything with excellence. Um, but it is make sure you budget time for that, especially if it's not sold yet. You have the luxury of time. If you are already set up on a network and they're expecting it, you might not be able to scrutinize every shot like we were able to do. Like we had, like I said, that luxury to say, all right, we want to fix these shots or like coloring, for example, or getting rid of birds or traffic noise in the background. Like we did a lot of really good cleanup if we needed to. We had almost no ADR for the entire show. And wow. I know that's unusual. Um, we had one session with Madeline Carroll and a lot of her session was new lines that my director thought of a great ending for our fifth episode that we needed some new lines for. And so we pulled her into an LA studio, uh, Kappa Studios, where we did a lot of our post. And, uh, but if anyone is going into this world and producing, just remember, you're going to have to take a lot more time than you think in that post process. Yeah. One of the things that I love that you did, 
uh, is you wanted to make sure that it was completely local here mm -hmm. in Georgia. Yeah. And I think we need, I think that's the, I think that's the next evolution mm -hmm. to Atlanta, the Southeast market is that, you know, shows, are are kind of they they're born and then premiere in LA or New York and yeah. you know a lot of times they come here to film mm -hmm. and and we get to benefit from that but the the post it's like just the from start to finish everything like it was very important to you that you mm -hmm. that you did everything here and I just love that mm -hmm. about this project because I think we need more of that and I hope this inspires many people to believe that it can be done and so why was that important to you and um well, I guess let's mm -hmm. start there. Yeah. Sure. Well, my husband and I moved here from Los Angeles in 2015. And back here, Atlanta was known as Little Hollywood. And that was the nickname. I mean, I think now it's almost overtaken Hollywood, so it's not so little anymore. But we came here on purpose thinking we wanted to get closer to family there in North Carolina, but we wanted to come where things were being in, were in production. At the same time, we're not studio people. Like we didn't want to move near Trillith. We love Trillith and the people down there, but we decided to move to Woodstock, Georgia, which is gorgeous, has lakes and mountains. And as I got to know the area and fell in love with what everything looked like, I was like, I'm going to start writing projects that fit here, hoping that I can talk people into staying here. Because one thing that you find in all the productions here, very little of the writing happens here. And it's like that above the line part of the pre-production or the development is still LA, it could still be New York, or a script might be found from anywhere. And then it, they choose a state to film it in. In our case, I'm like, I want to actually develop here as well. I'd like to see the state incentives improve for the writing because mostly they only cover writing rooms that have a staff during a certain portion of time. But when it comes to like if I were to sell and make a spec script, it doesn't count for incentives here. And that's a big deal on when you're trying to qualify for the for the um, incentives, which we did, but only on the production and some of the post-production side did. But it was also it was important to me because I love community. I love working with people that I already know and love. And the first person that I met up in uh, Cherokee County was Molly Mercer at the Cherokee um, Office of Economic Development. And she's the one in charge of locations. And I'm like, all right, I, I'm like, I'm going to make something here. And she hung in there with me for like, since 2017 of me saying this oh until we finally gosh. made something in 2022. And what was really neat was um, she was very helpful in helping me find the right places. And then I would go visit them before writing. Like the farm that we shot, the Stewart family farm that we used that um, Charlene Amoya's character, um, that's her character's family farm, that was used in some music videos first. And Molly was the one who found that place and introduced it to some of our team members. And they shot music videos there for a while. And then my husband was on one of those and he told the homeowner, my wife is going to want to shoot a movie here. And so when this came up, I went and met with them. I think it was February. I'd started the scripts in January. And I said, can I just tour your whole property? Can I write this show around your property? And use every nook and cranny of it. I mean, there's rolling hills. There's a gorgeous cross they had on a hill that we were able to use. Um, creeks and then the wraparound porch and the treehouse even and the barn. Like I used every single inch that I could <laughs> of beautiful production value that already existed there. And so that was nice um, as well as using local cast and crew wherever possible. That's it's so smart. It's so funny. Um, so we'll do our our online community is called Actor Spark, and mm -hmm. usually toward the end of the year when things are a bit slower, we do like a micro budget film festival. Oh, funny! And we tell everyone to go make like a three minute <laughs> film, but we bring in uh, Kurt Mega. Shout out to Kurt! But we bring him in because he's made so many short <laughs> films, and he gives everyone like seven steps to make a short film or eight steps. I forget exactly mm -hmm. what it was, yeah. but one of them was use what you have yep. like, right to the resources exactly yes. and it's just so smart yeah. and so i feel like a lot of writers are, are they're they're dreaming up what they want probably mm -hmm. as opposed right. to it feels like when you started you were thinking about the end goal not mm -hmm. the end goal is me writing this script it was right. How can we actually get this thing made? Mm -hmm. How right. can we utilize all of this and like get this done very mm -hmm. quickly? And that's probably why you had such quick success from mm -hmm. getting it started. Right. Well, one of the nice things was there was a couple of partnerships we had, which was like, say, Circle of Friends. I don't know if you've heard of them, but it's a cafe in Woodstock that hires adults with developmental disabilities. And when I first started having all my actor meetings, I didn't even know what project we were going to make yet, but I was meeting every time we'd go to that cafe. It's in the same place where the um, Molly works in the Office of Economic Development. And so 
while I was there, I asked the people who run it, I'm like, can I set something here sometime? And I didn't know yet what that would be. But when it came time to brainstorm these six episode ideas, I was like, can I set an episode that centers around this outreach into the community? And thank God, I mean, it all came together. It was difficult because it's on a college campus. So we had a lot of moving parts that we had to make work together for this one day of filming. And we used their real cafe. We used their real staff, all like uh, any staff that was available are extras in the scene. And then we hired an actor named David DeSanctis, who has Down syndrome, to play the character because he's an actor. He's done leads in movies before. So we wanted to hire someone um, that had been in movies before that was able to handle the lines for that part. But we put him behind the counter, had him pretend that that's the job he gets in real life. They let us use their logo and name. And now the show can serve as a decent um, calling card for them as continuing to spread the word about go open a cafe that is going to employ these people. And they just opened a new one called Flourish Cafe that I'm like, okay, next time I'm going to be shooting in uh, your new cafe. <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah. You know what I love about that so much? And that, that's just like a perfect example of how we can still focus on serving mm -hmm. in the things yeah. that we're doing. And, yeah. and I think that can go maybe a little like unnoticed or not mm -hmm. thought of is like, hey, we're we're going to serve our audience and, and we have a very specific story mm -hmm. that we're going to tell, which I, I look forward to getting into here soon. Yeah. But I mean, that's just a whole other element mm -hmm. of like, and yeah. how can we help the community and how can we right. help these other business owners mm -hmm. and and, you know, maybe it drives a lot, mm -hmm. maybe it drives a yeah. little, but it's, it, right. we, you know, we, we tried and I, and I love that mm -hmm. about that idea. Well, since you brought that up, one thing I'd like to mention is we wrote a devotional study guide to go with the series, um, the book here um, that the director and I co-wrote. And one of the, my favorite parts about the book is, I mean, we dive deep into questions, discussion questions for every episode and just looking at the deeper themes of everything in it. But the other fun part was we wrote what we call activations, and that is when you get a group together, what is inspired by what happens in the show that you as a group could go out and do that is going to affect your community? And one of the ones I put in that episode's chapter was go find your local community's version of this kind of cafe and go there. Like instead of just going to Starbucks, go to the one where you can support these people and encourage them in the job that they're doing and serving you. Um, and it's also helping pay for them to make a living. Um, in addition to that, like, let's say our show has stones in it that have encouraging words on it. I want everyone to get together and have rock parties and paint words and go hide them someplace and just be like, I wonder who's going to get this word and is it going to matter to them the day that they find it? It's like, that's the kind of outreach we want to extend. We don't want it to just be a TV show people watch. We want to have that community beyond. That's so cool. And in the devotional book there, I, I think that's just such an innovative idea mm -hmm. in a time where I think movies and TV shows need innovation, you mm -hmm. know, like yeah. there's so much, like, it seems like there's so many of the streaming services now, and there's so much content, like your favorite show. I mm -hmm. maybe not, I've never even yeah. heard of it. The thing <laughs> I just watched yesterday, you're like, maybe I've heard of it, right? There's just yeah. so much stuff out there. And so I love this idea, even, even beyond the devotional mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. um, faith based, you know, aspect to it. Like, I mm -hmm. think, this is an innovative idea that could just be on all television shows. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. and I just think it's so, so cool. What yeah. what else um, is within that book mm -hmm. that, that yeah. we should be excited about diving into? Yeah. Well, and it, I would say like some of the other things that we encourage with the show is, I mean, number one is mentorship and finding people to mentor. And so we have so many threads throughout the whole series of you get these Bible characters show up to mentor someone. And then you've got this young girl who Madeline Carroll plays and she's got to show up and help these people, even though she feels totally ill-equipped. But it's that idea that be there for people, like the tagline of the show is you are never alone. And so that's all throughout our devotional is how can you show up for people and be there for them in their time of need and relate to people in the crises that they might be in at that time. And so, or just even the tangibles where McKenna is on probation in the show and um, she gets a job at a thrift store. And um, I mean, it's kind of, she's sentenced to work there for minimum wage, but um, <laughs> we used... First Baptist Church of Woodstock's thrift store for that setting. And I'm hoping that people would be like, they watch the love interest volunteer with her to sort stuff. I hope people will go sort stuff at a at a place that is selling clothes that help feed back into the community. Like they feed a lot of people, like literally food um, outside of that thrift store and all the proceeds go to helping people. So it's like, I would love to see that kind of thing come out of stuff like that. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that look. <laughs> um, that's so awesome. So, so I, I wanna, 
I think let's just dive into the story a little bit. It's sure. so cool. But I do also want to dive into the multiple roles that you have and being able to juggle all that. But mm -hmm. since we're kind of talking about the story, let's yeah. stay there. It's a really cool idea, the, the, this whole story of the biblical characters mm -hmm. that, that live in the Bible <laughs> existing today, but in... I want to say like different forms, but like different jobs, like whether yeah. it be a doctor or, or somebody like that. They like, work undercover. <laughs> yes, they're undercover, <laughs> yes. right? So uh, yeah. so where, where did this idea come from? And, sure. and what I love about it too, and we, we kind of talked about this before we started, is like, there's like some real legs to this. Like mm -hmm. there's six episodes that everyone can look forward to watching, but I mean... Yeah. We could do a hundred of these episodes. Like <laughs> oh, yes, that would be so great. <laughs> right? So, yeah. so uh, yeah. elaborate a little bit more for us. Uh, my executive producer, Jeanette, um, who is the one who this show would have never happened without her, um, she, her pastor, um, Tim, wrote, I guess he was really bored during COVID and he wrote a play. And a lot of it had like these two person scenes where a Bible character shows up and talks to someone in crisis, like in a park um, and that kind of thing. And eventually he's like, oh, and it turned it into a book manuscript. And he worked with this prayer warrior at his church named Peggy. And Jeanette read the manuscript. She's like, I think you need to see this. There's something to this. And it was based on this really weird verse in the Bible. No offense, but uh, <laughs> Matthew 27. It's so great. Um, where when Jesus died on the cross and then he rose from the dead, the, these other tombs broke open. And it says the saints rose from the dead and started walking around and talking to people. It's one of those weird things that you're like, wait, what? <laughs> right. <laughs> what does that mean? And so this pastor asked himself this brilliant question, this what if they never left? Yes, it's fictional. It's just allegorical. We're not saying that we believe that that's still happening today. But that springboard is what allowed me to take the idea and turn it into a television series. Because she had asked me, is this a movie or what? And I'm like, no, it's a show. And that's because, like you just said, 100. We could do 100 combinations of someone in crisis being matched with a Bible character. And the fun part for me was playing with, okay, I'm going to put them undercover. Like, Someone shows up as a landscaper. Another girl is a guidance counselor. And, um, you know, we we put them in that undercover role, kind of like Touched by an Angel, where you don't tell who you are yet. You relate to the person. And we as an audience can understand some of the funny subtext, like when someone's complaining about Sarah of the Bible and she's talking to Sarah of the Bible, but she doesn't know that's who she is yeah. yet. And Sarah's just kind of sitting there like, I can't tell her yet, you know. So, um, but anyway, so it's that kind of fun device. But at the same time, one of our goals in doing that was, let's say a lot of people today may say, oh, that's from the past. That doesn't apply to today. But it really does apply today. The things and the pains that they went through in the past and the mistakes they made, we show they're flawed. They are not perfect pedestal human beings. Um, but we're able to show like, say, uh, to give an example, Rahab. Rahab in the Old Testament was a prostitute. And so we used her to come undercover as a, bi as a guidance counselor in a high school for a teenager who's a cutter. And she has um, self-esteem issues because of some promiscuity with her boyfriend in, um, in high school. So when she feels bad about herself, um, Rahab's able to say to her, well, I was a prostitute. So there is no judgment here. And she is able to offer a lot of grace and help redirect her life in a new direction. Um, that, that's just one example of how we're able to take that concept and put them in the guest star storylines. At the same time, we have this family um, that uh, Charlene Amoya plays the mom, Rusty Joyner plays the father, and Madeline Carroll plays the daughter. And the mother is the one who used to be assigned to match these, to help match these people. She's like the feet on the ground person who says, okay, you need to work undercover as a hospice worker. I'm going to set you up over here. I'm the temp agency on the phone. Uh, that's our first episode oh, cool. we do with Cameron, Ar <laughs> Cameron Arnett plays that hospice worker and um, helping a dying man reunite with the son. And but that's what Madeline has to do because her mother has died. And that's not a spoiler. You find it out in, in the, the trailer. trailer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you find it out in the first frame of the show that she says, if you're watching this video on my phone, I'm gone. And so but she's trying to fill her mother's shoes in this supernatural world that she knows very little about. Oh, McKenna, if you found this on my phone, it means I'm gone. Her death, it's it's on me. Not the way your father sees it. He thinks it's his fault. Do you have any idea what I would give to hear her voice just one more time? A door appears in my closet. The same door that opened for me, it'll be there for you too. It leads to Central Dispatch. McKenna Stewart, please report to Central Dispatch. What? This is a dream, right? People still need help, even though your mother is gone. 
Look, Mick, I know this sounds out there. People from Bible days, like Miriam or Aaron, they're still with us. As in, still alive, but undercover. Do you have any medical experience, or do you just play nurses on TV? <laughs> they are one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. You're definitely not alone in this. We are right where we are supposed to be, McKenna. What are you? An angel? This whole helper role, I'm gonna have to bow out. Rise up and accept this life-changing role I know you were born to play. Your job is to get the courier assigned to this appointment on the inside. This young woman needs your help desperately. Who are you people, really? If you wanted to grab coffee or something, I want you to feel safe with me. I'm starting to see a little more of your mom in you. Do you ever get used to this miracle stuff? Still amazes me every single time. Awesome. You know, I, I also really love about this idea and this story <laughs> is that I think it can be so inspiring <laughs> for the for the viewers mm -hmm. to like they can be that miracle for someone. That's exactly you know? right. And it's mm -hmm. like it it's like the you know cuz you mentioned like the the landscaper, right? Yeah. And I think the immediate thought is like well the landscaper is just like cutting my grass and then he's going to invoice yeah. me or mm -hmm. you know is he able to have that conversation with someone mm -hmm. when someone really needs it? And you just never know what someone's right. going through and you know kindness is free, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. like let's yep. share that as often yep. as possible. Yeah. Well, and in the case of that particular story it's Samuel, which is um Hannah's son who she gave up to service like she wanted a kid so bad and then she gave him up to service and in this story the parallel for that is that's our circle of friends episode where the young man with down syndrome his mother's too overprotective and won't let him live in the world because of bullying and so they show up as landscapers it's an act of kindness she doesn't want them there and, she, and it's a gift they're like it's a free gift we're doing it you know it's you know it's so cute they're just like well it's a free dealio we're like, <laughs> we're just going to get to work and then the the mom is just suspicious of them. But then as she watches their acts of kindness, she warms up to them and starts talking to them. And that's when they have a chance to talk to her about don't hide him from the world. He's a gift. And then they're able to actually suggest you get a job at the cafe. So, wow. you know, but that's why where the landscaping thing comes in is making something pretty because she can't keep up with it. She's a single mom, you know. Got it. And, and, and how did I just I'm trying to imagine being on set with you guys <laughs> the whole time and, uh -huh. and just these messages over and over mm -hmm. and over and, and what you're trying to convey. How did creating this show change Cheryl's day to day life? You mean during production or after? I mean, after <laughs> like because, yeah. you know, we're talking about like being that miracle for others. Mm -hmm. Like, do you yeah. is that more? Are you like more aware of that? Because I really hope that this episode for a lot of people is like you can begin to make that type of difference in someone's life. Like right now, you just have to decide. Right. And did that, I don't know, did that become more apparent to you or you've always kind of lived that way or? I'm not that good. No, um, <laughs> I want to be that good and I want to have that kind of time. And I think the thing that this show inspires me to want to do is to make time and opportunity and to be able to look out and not so me focused. I think the challenge with when you're the showrunner, producer, the post-production supervisor, the writer, the <laughs> everything, and now the PR person and the mar helping with the marketing. Oh my gosh. Like, and, uh, and even helping sell the show, it's life has been so consumed with so many like 18 hour days. I'm also a teacher, by the way, of screenwriting. So it's like trying to juggle all that makes it very hard to make time for what you're talking about. Right. And I hope that like once the show comes out and I can start knocking some of those things off my to-do list that I can do what you're talking about. And I already asked my neighborhood, we shot in my neighborhood for the first episode, the scene that I'm in. Um, I already asked them, I'm like, so either in October or after the first of the year, can we do a neighborhood project where we um, sponsor Getting the Rocks get all the ladies together, paint them, and then have another field trip to go downtown Woodstock and hide them. And so I'm hoping to do more things like that once my schedule gets less insane. 
I feel that. You know? I feel that. Yeah. Well, speaking of the insane schedule and <laughs> all of the jobs that you had yeah. taken on, is there... Did, how did you like that process? Did you like being the showrunner, writer? Because it, you know, mm -hmm. if you teach writing, uh, you yeah. know, you a lot, a lot of what yeah. you do is writing. So you've mm -hmm. taken on ma yeah. many more roles. Did you like having more control in in, in doing more stuff, or was it like, mm -hmm. I don't know? I like kind of just being in mm -hmm. the one lane. I like both, and for different reasons. Um, I love being a writer for hire. I love working on other people's projects. The number one thing I've been able to write is adaptations, and we can get into that later. But um, I love that producer writer relationship, and then I write it and I give it to them because it's theirs. It's their passion. They're the ones who went and found the project. In this case, this was my first chance to produce what I wrote, and that that had a lot of beauty that came with it. And to be able to steward something from start to finish was very rewarding. The challenge that comes with it is you spend a lot of time not writing. And because my number one passion is writing, I cannot wait to get back to where I can focus on that. I'm also an introvert, so being around a lot of people can be challenging at times. But um, but I mean, I, I, there is no way to even calculate the blessing that this has been so far. Um, the, it does get tricky when you're on a lower budget that you end up having way too many jobs. And I remember times during pre-production, the director came and stayed with me for the first few days. And I'm standing at my kitchen table typing like crazy. And she's like, would you take a lunch break? And I'm like, if I take a lunch break, you're not going to have a show to shoot in a week. Like it was that kind of craziness. And I'm like, I'm doing insurance paperwork and SAG paperwork. And I had just had a whole lot of responsibilities that was a lot to juggle. And I mean, thankfully, it all came together and everything that we were doing for the 25 day shoot went exactly as we needed it to. It's like nobody got sick. It never rained. A hurricane came through town and the scene is sunny and windy. <laughs> it's in the trailer. Yeah. With Madeline's hair is blowing all over the place. But they were telling me, we're probably going to have to cancel the shoot. I'm like, no, we're not. No, nope. yeah. we're going to be it's fine. Like, <laughs> and I did the original line schedule, which was so tightly wound. I mean, I, I don't recommend that to anybody. Like, But I was like, oh, this singer that's in episode four is only available for two of our... 25 days, those are the two days we're going to film with her. Or another girl was only available at the beginning. We are, I'm finding a new location that's going to accommodate her. So, but I wanted her. And so that was the cool thing of having relationships with people that I loved and knew were going to do a bang up job in this show um, that I was able to shuffle that before we ever even got to traditional pre-production. <laughs> wow. So many puzzle pieces. It was. And, pu yeah. Puzzle. Exactly. <laughs> I love that stuff though. That's awesome. Like line schedule is fun. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's fun to me, but you know, yeah. that's why, that's yeah. why you're here. <laughs> yeah. for, uh, and so you mentioned relationships and I think that's so important. Well, I mean, relationships are important, but I guess what I mean is, is building those relationships and nurturing them. And I just think that there's just an overarching theme of like the importance of that. Mm -hmm. Cause you, you said, what, what was it? 2017 that you were speaking with the, that the lady about like, I'm going to film something. Oh, yeah. Molly. Yeah. yeah, yeah Molly. And, and so yeah. it's like, yeah, that was such a long journey, right. Of, <laughs> yes. but like nurturing that relationship mm -hmm. and, and just, I think whether it be like just being there for someone or genuinely mm -hmm. caring about someone right. to be able to connect with them right. and the importance of that. Cause you, you just never know mm -hmm. who's gonna, who you're going to call on. Right. And so I think there's just such a really cool lesson there of focusing on nurturing those relationships and mm -hmm. being there for one another. And, and you just never know when you, you're mm -hmm. going to be there to help someone else Absolutely. or you need them to, to come be yeah. there for you. <laughs> Well, in this case, like um, I have a couple of stories that would go with that. One is I met my executive producer in 2017 as well. She had hired me to work on a project for her and we just stayed friends. And then when I was getting frustrated about not being able to produce my own work, she was like, well, what do we need to do to make that happen? And so that's why I say, I mean, this would never have happened without her. But also um, the director, and I can get into the actors on that same note, but the director and I I wrote her a fan letter when I was 15 years old. What? Yeah. And so she had produced something and direct, or directed and wrote something that I loved. And I'm like, how do I do what you do? And this is in the area, era before internet. I mean, finding her and writing her letter and it got to her is a miracle in and of itself. And she wrote back. And then um, I just said, how do you do what you do? And then I, I adopted her as a mentor, whether she wanted to be adopted or not at the time. <laughs> like she didn't know me yet. But anyway, later she told me to go to Regent University. Um, and when I did... I listened to her and, and I was getting a film degree in grad school and I showed up in her office because that's she worked out of there um, to make those shows. And I'm like, all right, I'm here. Give me an internship. And then eventually she did of 
reading scripts. So she taught me how to read and evaluate scripts at that point for their production company. And then I never let her go since. It's always been our dream to work together. Like she, both as a writer and for her as a director, I have zero interest whatsoever in directing. And so for her and I to get to do this together was just such a dream come true. And Charlene already knew her. So it was great. That's how we ended up getting Charlene, the relationship. Oh, wow. You know, and I had worked with Cameron Arnett, Karen Abercrombie and Madeline Carroll and other movies of mine. And so when I was working on this and I had them in mind for roles, I was like, I wanted to attach them in advance. And I went to Karen. I remember over Christmas going, so I have this thing we're working on, this TV show. What do you think of it? She's like, wow. She's like, that's fresh. That's interesting. Yes, I'm on board. Same thing, Cameron Arnett. And then Madeline, I wrote it all for her and then sent her the scripts and said, please come play with me. And thank God she said yes, because she's so amazing in the role. But yes, it's that relationship and the past and the history of working with people and knowing that when you're going to work on something independently first, that we didn't want a producer or a network in advance so we could just make the show, build the team that we wanted here. Because I was afraid the first thing would happen if we got someone involved is suddenly it's shooting in Canada. Nothing against Canada. I'm also Canadian and American, both. Or, you know, But I wanted but, it but to be here. But for Georgia. Yes. <laughs> and I wanted it to be here because I wanted to be home, you know. And so for us to be able to make it independently is why we could choose the actors we wanted in advance. And then we, I mean, we had casting sessions for about nine of the roles that we found gems almost all in Georgia. I, I think most of those were all locals. I said one exception from Florida, Denise Gossett, that we brought in to play the mom of the young man with Down syndrome. And he also was from out of town. Uh, but that was a special talent that was really difficult to find. Um, but overall, I mean, we found a lot of locals that were like we would have never heard of had we not had that open call audition. And we did, we were the ones that they said we did uh, in-person callbacks. And that was in 2022. And a lot of the actors were like, oh, it's so wonderful to be back in the room with people. Sorry. You know, and so that was fun to be able to do that for people local. Oh, I didn't see you there. You might be wondering what the heck is the Virtual Actors Summit? Well, listen up and I'll enlighten you. Picture this, a Zoom session that doesn't suck. I know, it sounds impossible, right? But trust me, this isn't your typical snooze fest where you're stuck watching someone's forehead for hours. We're actors. We know how to make things exciting. The Virtual Actors Summit is a three-day extravaganza where you'll learn from the best in the bits. Guest instructors, agents, and casting directors think of it as a crash course in acting awesomeness, minus the turtlenecks and pretentious monologues. You'll get hands-on training. Actors will get real-time feedback and the chance to actually participate. No more passively listening while you're secretly scrolling on TikTok. We're talking active engagement here, people. Still wondering what the heck this is? It's your ticket to leveling up your acting career. Whether you're in a place trying to snag an agent, get more auditions, trying to book more acting jobs, this summit is your golden ticket to help you get there. And the best part? There's no upcoming union strikes to worry about. So there's no sudden plot twist here. So what the heck is the Virtual Actors Summit? It's your chance to learn some new skills, get re-energized, not even have to put on pants. Register now and I'll see you there. You talked about this never would have happened without the executive your executive producer. Yes. And I want to talk about there's there's two points to this that I think are really important. One, that you were open and kind of vulnerable enough to say like I'd mm -hmm. like to do this, but I just mm -hmm. feel like I can't. Yeah. And so one 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 side of the coin is being being open enough and vulnerable enough to share those types of feelings and thoughts and conversations with the people around you. But then next is then also being able to receive the well, wait, let's just figure it out. Yeah. Like, let, like, what do we got to yeah. do? Let's do it. Yeah. Because I think I think both are, can be hard to do for people. One, yes. just opening up. Mm -hmm. And then two, like, mm -hmm. let's figure this out together. Mm -hmm. And right. so I love that. I, I mean, we're better together. Yes. Uh, so I, I love that really you're like so, you're like, I never would. And I feel like most films and shows, like everyone's going to be like, never going to have done this by myself. So we need someone. So I just, can you kind of yeah. talk about those two sure. sides of the coin? Yeah, like with this case, what I appreciated about Jeanette was she trusted me with the creative side and the actors and even the director choice. And, um, and even though she would meet people, she watched all the auditions. That was what was so fun. We actually Zoomed her in because she's in California. And so when we did those callbacks, she was on a Zoom screen watching all of those actors. So she was very involved in all of that as well. 
But what was neat is she used to be um, like president of a company and she's, it's, she had a lot of expertise that I don't have. And she came to me at a time when um, we were trying to make my passion project, Never the Bride. And um, Susan was also going to be on as the director for that at the time. But I had a new entity that didn't want to make it the way that we wanted to. And I was complaining about this to Jeanette. And that's when she's like, well, what do you need in order to make this work? And that's when I explained the things I'm always missing is the structure of a company and the way to find money because I've never been able to in find investors for anything. Well, not never. Well, until now. But yes, up until that, well, we were having that <laughs> conversation. And then, but that was something that she felt she would be good at. Plus she has many other gifts that she could bring to the table. And like she was on set every day with us. Um, and just she was such a nice and calming presence and it was so great to have her around but it's neat that she could bring to the table all of our executive team her husband sam as well as another gentleman named mike burns and we all the four of us formed stone impact media um, i remember that one hour long brainstorm session where we came up with our name and it came together so easily of what we knew we wanted to be to define ourselves you know to make an impact stone you know we had two projects that have something to do with stones <laughs> It was a little bit about it. Plus, it's a symbol for Jesus. Um, but yeah, so that's the nice thing is that why not partner with people better than you at the other things? Because that makes us all, as you say, like stronger together. Yes, yes. That's awesome. So with what you do in writing and uh, like you said, you've you've done a lot of adaptations to things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I think of adaptation, it's it's you're taking a book and you're turning that into a script, right? So I'll think mm -hmm. of like larger books that have come out, like a Game of Thrones or something. Yeah. And you have some people that are like so excited about it, <laughs> and then other people that are like, this isn't like the book at all. <laughs> how yeah. how do you balance uh if you're taking the idea from the book and turning mm -hmm. it into yeah. a script for anyone that's thinking about that or likes that idea? How mm -hmm. do you balance that and really turn that into you know, respect the author, but then mm -hmm. do what needs to be done right. on the on the script writing side. Right. Well, what's awesome is when you can work with authors. You know, sometimes what I don't like is if the shove out necessarily, if you, you have nothing to do with it anymore. And I mean, there's that strange line between the expertise is different in book writing and screenwriting. And so you have to be really careful to say, we are going to have changes. And it's like, I know that's going to be uncomfortable in some cases, um, but you don't really have a choice because it's a visual medium. Like in our case, even with these stones, I had to add the family at the heart of it because you can't do a TV show without a family to follow. I can't, sure. just, I can't just do an episode that has just guest stars because that's not going to work. People are not going to keep coming back for more. Like the Twilight Zone, the anthology show, I couldn't do that style of a show and expect there to be the through line of the heart that people could follow outside of the guest stars. And so when I did other projects like um, Ultimate Gift, was sort of a self-help book that took place in a conference room. And so obviously you cannot make a movie that takes place in a conference room, but Jim Stovall was very open to the ideas that we got to take these adventures you're talking about that they're just verbally talking about across the table and you got to put it on its feet. You got to get it out of that room. And going on the adventures and turning, changing the point of view from the lawyer in the story, which was played by Bill Cobbs, um, to the kid in the story, the 24-year-old brat <laughs> that needed to be changed. He gets the character arc and he gets to go through all these adventures. Um, but in the even in that case, we had 12 gifts and 12 adventures he was supposed to take. And you can't fit that into a movie. So you, then you have to pick and choose what is most important that still serves the story. And in, hopefully within the heart of what the... Um, what the original author wanted to do. And so when it came to doing Extraordinary and Indivisible, those were both true stories that I loved being able to do. Like the people are still alive. I was either able to watch um, like documentaries that were done on them or in the case of Indivisible, this was such a happy accident. I was rewriting for the director and the production team. Um, they had a lot of really good stuff for the war scenes. And when I was called to ask to do it, I'm like, I can't write a war movie. What are you talking about? And they go, well, no, we want it to be a save a marriage movie and we want you to come in and work on the hearts of the women in the story. I'm like, okay, that I can do. I was supposed to interview the married couple that it's based on and I we were going to do a Zoom meeting and they said, by the way, we're in Canton, Georgia today. And so I'm like, I'm hopping in the car and we went and met at a restaurant for a couple hours and just sitting there face to face with them. I was like, tell me about your marriage and tell me about some of your funniest memories together. And those memories are in the script, whether they talk about them or we see something, 
that ended up making the movie that we wouldn't have known had I not just asked them that question. And so I love being able to dive deep. And when I can be faithful, I try to be faithful with the understanding that I still have a job to do. I like family of six siblings might be three, like, you know, cause we want to have better media roles for actors, but I've had to face that kind of decision before where it's like, I can't use everyone in your family. <laughs> in this story. Oh, no. I love everyone in your family, but I'm going to combine the sisters into one or, you know, it's that kind of choices that you have to make for the betterment of the movie, but not ruining the true story. If you can help it. Yeah. So the ultimate gift specifically was uh, like, as you just said, you know, it was focused more in uh, marriage and with those types of topics that can be pretty mm -hmm. meaningful. How, why is it that you're wanting to write about those? Is that mm -hmm. because you uh, feel like you have like a bit of an expertise there or that's where you see you can make impact or mm -hmm. there's something missing within marriage right. today? Like right. why why those types of yeah. Uh, themes? Yeah, and to clarify, it was actually Indivisible and Extraordinary that were both Save a Marriage movies. And the best thing about those, I got those jobs back to back and I had been married maybe two years at the time. And because I had to wait so long to get married, that's where the story of Never the Bride comes from. That was mm. kind of my comic story with accusing God of being asleep on the job of writing my love story. And he shows up <laughs> to face the charges. It's like Bruce Almighty, but rom-com realm. I had already come out with that project. And that was before Chris and I um, reconnected on Facebook of all places because we met in church in uh, the 90s in a singles class. And so we, we reconnected in like 2010. And then by, it was around, I think, 2000. 16, I think when I got those jobs to write both movies back to back. By then, I had been married maybe five years, and we have a very unusually good marriage. And it's a passion of ours to help marriages that have been in crisis in the past year. And so I was like, if I can write something that would help save a marriage, I really wanted to be able to do that. And so when Extraordinary came up, and that one wasn't necessarily inherently about that marriage. It was, you know, an extreme runner who had sometimes happened to really annoy his wife because he wasn't home enough and he wasn't prioritizing family. And so when I started digging into the real story, I was like, this is a marriage movie. This is kind of the wife's story. And so it was neat. Sherry Rigby played the wife in that movie. That's how I met her. And um, we were able to focus it on that because honestly, women drive the faith-based market. And so not making it just about the running and the quest that this man went on and about is he even paying attention to his family? And it was one of those things you write and you're like, you hope it makes a difference to the people who see it. And so that's a, just a big passion of ours. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, yeah. I, I want to, we're going to, we're going to dive into our spotlight sign off here, but okay. before we do, I want to make sure everyone knows <laughs> yes. how to watch these stones, okay. where it's coming out, when it's coming out. I think we got promo codes. Like yes. let's yes. Like, okay. give it. Awesome. Hit, hit the camera. <laughs> we want to make sure that we're sending yes. some viewers to this. So we are so excited that we are starting exclusively on Up Faith and Family. It's their streaming service. They do have a cable network, but we are starting on streaming. And so at their website at upfaithandfamily.com, um, we have a special code for our show. It's STONES30, which is um, all capitals, the word STONES, like our, our title, uh, with 30, um, just written out as the number 30. And if you put that in, they'll give you 30% off your first month. We premiere on September 5th, which is Thursday. Um, and they're going to release a new episode every Thursday. And so if you sign up, what we really want people to do is sign up from the beginning and then come back every week because they're going to have six weeks of premiere episodes starting with the 5th and then going all the way through October 10th. And the book we just released, uh, hot off the press this morning, um, it's now finished in paperback and hardback. And then the ebook will be available September 1st. But just go to Amazon and you'll find it under these stones. Uh, the title being uh, the official study guide for the TV series by myself, Cheryl McKay, and my director, Susan Rohr. I love it. Uh, so everyone, make sure to tune in this Thursday. You can be catching the first episode. And let's watch it like old school times, yes. right? Where it comes out once a week. I love yes. that idea. Yeah. Uh, so to start off our spotlight sign off, uh, what's something that you're incredibly grateful for today? Mm. I'm incredibly grateful for my husband and how supportive he has been from the beginning of all this because it's our lives can be kind of chaotic. And we couldn't do this if we didn't support each other in that. 
hundred percent. I mean, that support is so important. And, uh, I think, yeah, it, being in this business for sure, you, you need that. So that's yeah. awesome. I love yeah. that. Uh, what, uh, movie book or TV show changed the trajectory of your life? Hmm. Well, number one would be the Bible because I mean, I, I wish I would read it more than I do at the moment. Again, I've admitted I can be flawed at times, but I, there's all sorts of verses and things that mean something to me. Like my favorite is Ephesians 2.10, which is, you know, we are God's workmanship and he created works for us in advance for us to do. And I love, I love that verse for writers and for those of us who are called to this crazy business, you know, so, but another book um, that I really love is called Dialogue with God. It's by uh, Mark and Patty Verkler. And it was the first one I read years ago that taught me that I could actually stop, listen, and journal, and then ask God, you know, for guidance. And then if I sensed there was anything in particular he wanted me to do, just write it down. Incredible. Yeah. And and here we are with the with the devotional to, to, <laughs> yes. to continue. The, continue. I love it. Yes. Uh, what's something within your daily routine that you really cherish? Okay. So the dopey one would be... Um, <laughs> I eat chocolate every day of my life. Oh, yes. What kind? I know. Uh, dark only. Dark only. Okay. Five percent. Right. It's like my coffee because I don't drink coffee. I drink a lot of water, but I love my chocolate. It's like, and sometimes like if I'm writing and I I don't want to get tired, I'll have a little dish of chocolate chips on the desk. Nice. So I know that sounds crazy, but it's not um, crazy. I think everyone's <laughs> like, this is a good idea. Yes. <laughs> and plus, it's not as bad for you as everything else. So. Uh, but the other thing would be walking. I love walking every day. I love walking with my husband if he has time, or I like taking prayer walks because it's getting away from social media and the phone and the computer screens and everything and just getting out in nature. Um, that's one of my favorite things. I try to walk every day. George is a little harder than it is in LA when <laughs> the weather was almost always nice. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but here, you know, I, whenever we can. But you get the seasons here. Oh, I know. And I love leaves. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, we're so, like getting into fall. I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Um, what is something you're currently trying to improve in your life right now? The work-life balance. I think it's been very um, unbalanced for a little while, for, understandably, some right. of which we've already talked about. Um, there's just a lot to do and not a, sometimes not a big enough team to make that happen. So um, I would really like to find more time for quiet and for fun. And my husband and I um, love quality time. Like, so it's like, that's our love language. And so when we don't get quality time, it can be pretty tough. Uh, yeah. My love language is also quality time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah. I'm with you there. It's important. Yeah. You just gotta, you just gotta put stuff in the calendar, right? Yeah. You just gotta put it in the calendar and be like, we're doing yeah. it. Yes. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, last question. And, and we've gone over some cool stuff. Uh, but if you want to make sure that the listeners mm -hmm. got one thing other than watch these stones on Thursday, <laughs> yeah. uh, what would it be? I think I would take our tagline from the show, which is you are never alone. And that no matter what you're going through, don't give up. There's somebody out there with a listening ear who understands where you're at in life. And once you persevere and get through this, you can be that listening ear for somebody else. Love that. I love that. Well, Cheryl, it was incredible <laughs> chatting with you. Thank you so much for yes. being here. Well, thanks for having me, Jesse. You're so welcome. Everyone, again, Thursday, Up Faith and Family. Don't forget to use promo code STONES30. Save 30% on your first month and check out these stones. Follow this incredible journey. And again, Cheryl, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right, everyone. We'll see you on the next one. Bye.